computer. Okay, you're 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 looking out for the class. I appreciate it, Daniel. All right, we're in eighteen twenty one. I wonder what happened in eighteen twenty one. No, I'm talking about the United States. I don't know. I mean, the War of eighteen twelve is long over. Yeah, and we're, and we're, is that the Louisiana Purchase, or is that too early? Okay. What? No, I'm sorry. In our history, I'm talking about 1821. It's just something should be happening in 1821. I didn't know what was. In 19, whatever. Meanwhile, back on the ranch. Or volviendo al rancho. I had a Spanish student teach me that. Oregon Trail. Computers weren't even invented. <laughs> <laughs> Trail of Tears is later, believe it or not. Yeah. All right, let's go start here. Uh, Tom. Yes. Monadies, do you mind? Start reading for me, please. Yes. Uh, then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. As many as seven times. Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. So did you see the meme I saw yesterday? How many masks should I wear, Lord? Seven? No, I say to you, 77. <laughs> <laughs> Melody's not laughing, so okay. <laughs> Uh, so what do you think this means, just in case you're wondering? As much as needed. Mm -hmm. So so 78, you're not clear. Okay. So Tom, continue, please. Uh, Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him 100 denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay, it, pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. What are, what's the Lord's prayer? Prayer, you know, um, some versions forgive us our debts as we forgive those, as we forgive our debtors. Um, kingdom of heaven. It's not different than the kingdom of God. You'll have some people try to say that. It's two different expressions. Um, heaven becomes a substitute for the word God as they try to they try to avoid saying the Lord's name a lot. So they'd say heaven instead of God. But so what Jesus is doing here, I don't know. But it's the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, same thing. And a talent, of course, is a huge sum of money. And um, I have a note on the word that I found that there are 150,000 years of payments to spend on debt. <laughs> well, talents are what what countries, though countries, are measured in talents. And so this is an extreme. This is hyperbole, obviously. He owed him $10 billion. So have patience and I'll pay it. <laughs> okay. And the other one, oh, what? You said 10 billion. Some extreme yeah. uh, figure. What was the 10 denarii? Uh, 
a day's wage for labor. So a hundred. That's a yeah, three months, four months work would be uh, that'd be a substantial sum, but it wouldn't be talents. So forget that's what we we do. That one's pretty obvious. Nineteen verse one, and we will pick up with Jane. That's probably in your Bible, isn't it? Uh, mine says a few thousand dollars. Okay. But Jane's song, you taught, I taught. That's more than a day's wages. Yes. A hundred days wages, about 50 bucks. <laughs> Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan, and large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Now, the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. <laughs> so he's on the other side of the Jordan. Uh, hmm. That's interesting. Why, why is that? Well, because that's not where. There's Rick. What? <laughs> <laughs> what I could sneak in the back door and uh, can see the man. Hey, here's, here's the map. There's food over there. Good. Don't eat it. I don't care. <laughs> so he's over here which is not ordinarily you'd expect him to be over here. But this is uh, part of Herod's, the Tetrarch's area, it's over here as well. So, okay. So, so what, what four or two tribes are they supposed to be? Well, the, yeah, that's long kind of been merged, but yes, there's, this is Jew, Jewish territory as well. It would be, this is um, Bentonville. Oh, it's in a different area. Okay. okay. Did you get that? See what I did there? Bentonville. <laughs> I almost said it'd be like Ocala, but now I realize we're not in Georgia anymore. I can't use Alabama. It's the thing. All right, back to the text. And let's. Let's read. Uh, who was reading? You were. And the Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? That's the key phrase. I mean, the Bible has divorce statutes. So obviously it can be lawful, but it's this. That is what he's going to. Now, what's going on? Give you a little background. Remember when I went through my divorce, I did a whole teaching on this because I wasn't sure. Um, well, I have a Leah and a Cora. This is Leah. And what I was going to go through was which one's the older? I'm, I'm the older. I, I'm, <laughs> that's, let me rephrase that. What I was trying, going through is which name goes with the older? Okay, because C comes before L, so that's backwards. But the L is higher. There you go. <laughs> All right, so at the time of Jesus, uh, Judaism, of course, is a multifaceted religion, and they have, um, within Phariseeism, you have different sub-schools, okay? Uh, just like Central as a Nazarene church is a different experience than a small town Nazarene church, all right, just because different environments. And two major players are a guy named Hillel and a guy named Shammai. Shammai has died by the time this story is coming around. Hillel is still around. And Shammai had a very strict interpretation of the law 
So work, you pick up more than this and you're doing work sort of stuff. Where's Shemai going, no, you can pick up this. I mean, Hillel said, you can pick up this and you're not doing work. It's this, this sort of stuff. And Shemai was very strict. No, the divorce are for the reasons specified in the Bible. Uh, failure to provide and failure of conjugal relations is essentially what it boils down to. And so uh, adultery falls into that mix um, and this sort of stuff. Whereas Hillel, by the time this has come around, it's divorced for any reason in Judaism. You can, and that's the current case when Jesus is being asked this question. You can get divorced for any reason. And the whole point of a divorce is to allow you to remarry. Okay. If, I mean, because otherwise you can just leave. Um, but so it's not a question of who can get remarried. That's what a divorce does. The divorce gives you a leak, gives the woman, because a husband can have, a guy can have as many wives as he wants. So it's a non issue. But a woman cannot. And if she has a husband, she has to have a legal release so she can marry another one from the person. Does that make sense? And um, this is the background to this question. And the Pharisees, they're not united, okay? Because they're debating this issue. Is it for any reason? Or is it for the uh, biblical reason specified? And uh, Janie, he answered. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. For they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. Now here's where it gets interesting. Text actually doesn't say, and the two shall become one flesh. It says, and they shall become one flesh. <laughs> because where he's going with this, he's limiting the marriage to one wife. And that's where the church ends up going. And society is all. Unless you're that Thai masseuse who's got nine wives that's living in harmony, according to uh, the BBC. No. But um, Jesus has made the two shall become one flesh. And so he's doing strict, like uh, Shammai, and maybe even stricter. That hasn't come out that he's limiting it to one, but he's laying the groundwork for it with this. Hmm. And what God has joined together, don't let anybody separate. Verse 7. They said to him, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? He said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, and marries another, commits adultery. And this is where the church has kind of screwed it up a little bit. They don't realize what he's saying here. He's saying, he's agreeing with Shammai. You got to have biblical reasons for divorce, which are only two, to be fair. But nevertheless, they're there. And it's not just sexual immorality. But for example, a man abusing his wife, it's grounds for divorce. And we don't have to go through the mental acrobats, acrobatics that you see some preachers, some people go through to kind of justify it. Well, that's sexual immorality in this way or whatever. No, it's not. If you don't need that. That's the grounds for divorce. Um, now, when he does this, imagine the turmoil he's on the issue. Because he's just declared a whole slew of marriages to be invalid. Because you, you divorced her for any reason. It was not one of the two specified and this is going to be havoc in the society and it's going to create turmoil the disciples ask if such is the case of a man and his wife it is better not to marry but he said to them not everyone can now uh, pause i just wonder if peter is the one asked that because <laughs> he has a wife <laughs> Okay, go ahead. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, 
but only those to whom it is given. For there are Enochs, Eunuchs. Eunuchs, who have been so from birth. And there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. No, I don't think he's advocating actual castration, but the idea of living a celibate life. And, you know, the priests in the Roman Catholic Church and in uh, Orthodoxy go in this direction. So, um, <clears throat> he's setting up against the Pharisees and he's just or at least one part of it and this he's willing to do turmoil in society for a second this is a big deal we often get a picture of Jesus as this passive or genteel sort of guy this I guarantee you when he said that in the crowd because of what he just said and declaring all those marriages invalid in his mind. Hmm. Let's pick up here. Um, who do we have here? I got to do it this way. I don't know who's here. Jeff Hunt. Yeah. You already read though, didn't you? No. No, you didn't. Would you please pick up in Matthew 19, 13? Sure. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Now, I don't know what the turmoil is here. I mean, there's no saying about this or anything. I don't know It's just why the disciples would have a problem with it. Except that, no, don't bother him, he's busy. Go ahead and she said, whoa, dude, no. Uh, no, no. You got to be like them to come into the kingdom anyway. And then one of my favorite stories. Jeff, I'm going to, no, no. Jeff Hunt? Yeah. Can you pick up with this as well? Sure. And behold, a man came up to him saying, teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. And if you would enter life, keep the commandments. All right, now, rich young ruler. Now, remember in Judaism, at this time, and true in some churches, too, if you think about it, a uh, friend of mine belonged to a church. And if you gave over some amount, you were invited to be on the board. And he did an experiment. Did you see if that was the case? So he gave a thousand bucks. The friend is Buster. I mean, I'm just saying, it's a typical thing he would do. Going, I have a feeling. So he gave a thousand dollars. Sure enough, he got invited. He went, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't think I need to <laughs> pay my dues to get in. But in Judaism, being wealthy and prosperous was a sign of your holiness and sanctification because God rewarded that. So if you were rich, you obviously were keeping the covenant, right? And uh, and so Jesus says, keep the commandments. Remember how a covenant works. We've talked about this a lot when we were earlier in the Old Testament. Um, the covenant is an agreement, and you're agreeing to do something. And there are certain stipulations that we agreed to to maintain this covenant. And that's the law. The law is what says, okay, my keeping this says I'm in the covenant sort of stuff. And it's necessary. And if you're any covenant's going to have the, you have agreements. If I make a contract with Jeff, we're agreeing to certain things that have to be fulfilled or the contract. Otherwise, what's the point of the contract? Selling the house? Well, I'm going to give him money. He's going to give you the house. Those are the sorts of stipulations. And the law is that sort of thing in the covenant with God. And remember, Moses gave the law, and we read that part in Deuteronomy 18, where God says, I'm going to send another prophet like you. And remember, that's what they asked John the Baptist. Are you, are you the prophet? He goes, no. Because it turns out Jesus is the prophet. And when we read the Sermon on the Mount, I was telling you, that's his version of the law. 
This is what it's going to take. That boils down to, remember the Augustinian boiling it down to, love God, love your neighbor, do what you want. Okay? But love God, love your neighbor, encompasses that. And um, this rich young ruler, we don't know, that, do we know he's rich? No, he's just a man. We're going to find out. He's rich, therefore he's keeping the commandments according to society. But apparently something's gnawing at it. So let's see how it unpacks. If you're in your life, keep the commandments. Verse 18, Jeff. He said to him, which ones? Now, that's a, Jesus. I love that question. Which ones? <laughs> not fair enough. Why not? And Jesus replied, why not? Well, all of them. Well, all of what? What are the commandments in the Old Testament? Can you answer that question? You know, you if you hang around Bible study long enough, you'll hear there, there are 618 commandments because that's Maimonides from 1200 AD, his counting of the commandments in the Old Testament and the Old Covenant. Um, others, the Ten Commandments. So there's only 10. But have you ever counted the commandments in the Ten Commandments? There's more than 10. And you say, okay. So it's not an unreasonable question as it sounds. Well, which ones? You know, so can I not pick this up or do I just not have to work on the Sabbath? That sort of stuff. Let's see what Jesus says. Jeff? Jesus said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, interesting. The only one that's not in the Ten Commandments is this one. Love your neighbor as yourself is not in the Ten Commandments. That's Leviticus 19. And, uh, but he, he does that. So look at the rich young rulers, or the, the young guy. Sorry, what does he say? 20. Young man said to him, all these I have kept. What do I still lack? Why is he asking that? <laughs> well, I think because he intuits that there's some, no, there's something wrong here. I waited tables for 20 years. That's so how I put myself through school. And I've worked in all kinds of restaurants. And where India Palace is now, at 71st and Lewis, was a quite expensive restaurant when I worked there. Different thing was owned by a mafia boss's wife. It was quite intriguing. But we catered to, we had a $25 peanut butter and jelly sandwich in 1983. Okay, that's a lot of freaking money. And a lot of rich people. And the chef there, Ari Barossa and his wife, she was a waitress. Um, but I was waiting on this table. And as I'm waiting on them, they decide to get a divorce. You know, when you're the waiter, you hear everything, right? Okay. So I go back to the back. I said, so-and-so, who everybody knows, because they're rich. He's getting divorced, and Ari goes, you know, that's why I've never wanted to have any money, because I've been doing restaurants with this category of clientele forever, and I've never met any of them that are happy. They get to the top, and there's nothing there. And I wonder if that's what's going on here. He's gotten to the top. And just, yeah. So let's see what Jesus says. Jeff, 21. And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Now, I have a particular take on this particular story. I think this is a disciple that Jesus wanted. He wanted the guy to be with him. And it's not going to happen, but he's going to be, he's, he's really wanting him to come. come so, yeah. Now, Realize what's that saying to the guy. Now, at this point, we don't know he's rich. But read 22 for me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. It's just sell so everything you have that marks me. It's righteous. Granted, I'm not very comfortable. I don't, I'm not at ease. But still, it was more than he could handle to think about this. And, I think Jesus is a little disappointed. And when you read the other versions, I think it comes out a little more clear. Um, 
So let's pick up this part. Mr. Jankowski, would you pick up verse 23? And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Pause. How many have heard the sermon or the teaching that the eye of the needle is a little door that you could go through. That, in fact, a camel could make it through. <laughs> yes, yeah, this little gate into the sutures. And I just, really, you, you create this thing out of whole cloth to negate what Jesus was saying. There is no little gate called the eye of the needle. There isn't. If anybody ever tells you that, just go, oh, okay. It's not there. And you couldn't unload the camel, come through, and then reload the camel. That's not what I'm, that's just all crap. And it's an attempt to completely circumvent what he's saying. It's hard. And now the disciples, of course, are flummoxed because of what I just told you. But wait a minute. If they're rich, that means they are keeping the covenant. And they're in good standing. This makes no sense. So verse 25, Jeff. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? So Jesus and, uh, do you understand their consternation? So the very thing that demonstrates, well, who can be saved? And, and Jesus' response is, uh -huh. <laughs> Go ahead. Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible. God, all things are possible. Yeah, God, God will take care of this. And his answer is not, and the guy will figure it out. No, I'm going to keep it for him. That, you don't know that yet. That's where this is hand, heading. I'm going to be his covenant compliance. Remember what I told you righteousness means. I burp in your face. Sorry about that. Righteousness is covenant compliance, which is what's, you know, to be part of God's family, you have to be part of the covenant. And what they haven't grasped yet is that's not going to be performance based. That's not going to be white knuckling. He hadn't come out and said it yet, but he's getting there. Huh? Verse 27. Then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Hey, just, I don't think it's snotty. I think he's legitimate. I mean, I got a wife up in Galilee. And you ask this guy to get, but we've done that. In essence, we've done that. So do we, in fact, have something coming? And what's he say? Jesus said to them, truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his throne, glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit an eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. It's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. But, and notice he specifies the 12 here. I think it's because he's gave up on number 13 there. All right, fine. We'll stay with 12. Um, Huh. You 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 were saying in the kingdom to come. Because what happens to these guys? What how does what's the end of Peter's life? Who remembers? He's crucified upside down. I can't be crucified like Jesus. That's just you know, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And you're in the Colosseum with all the lions. <laughs> yes, 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 he does. But and remember, martyrdom was so common that it was considered a baptism. You're going to get baptized, and then you're going to be martyred. That's what's going to happen. It got to the point where people were volunteering for it, and the church had to, no, no, no. We don't commit suicide by martyrdom. This is not what we're going to do. And they, it was a big struggle for the first two centuries dealing with this. Huh. Things that make you go, hmm. So chapter 20, verse 1, because we're doing so well. I need to make uh, 
Is that it? Wait, wait, Sally Ann. Ah, Mari. Yeah. Can we have a Wilmoth read for us, please? Yes. As soon as I get right here. Okay. For the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And going out about the third hour, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you go into the vineyard too, and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went, going out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, he did the same. And about the 11th hour, he went out and found others standing. And he All said, right, now, to put this in terms, the day, six hours, six in the morning, ninth hour, nine in the morning. No, I'm sorry. Six hours noon starts at six in the morning, the counting of hours. So three in the afternoon, five o'clock. He's going out and finding others standing. Keep going, Mark. And he said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? And they said to him, it's five o'clock somewhere. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and they said to him, because no well one done. Is <laughs> and he Keep going. Him, and he said to them, you go into the vineyard too. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning up or beginning with the last up to the first. And th when those hired about the 11th hour came, each of them received a denarius. Now, when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. And on receiving it, they grumbled at the master of the house saying, these last worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the, of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last worker as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? So the last will be first and the first last. Wow. So the thief on the cross gets in, you know, and are we going to begrudge that? Are we going to say, well, I ain't fair. I ain't fair. And the last will be first and the first last. Hmm. Let's pick this up. And uh, Kenny, verse 17. And as Jesus was going up to Jerusalem, he took the 12 disciples aside, and on the way he said to them. So they, they've gone from, they've crossed the Jordan, and they're heading up to Jerusalem. Let me get my, oh, what happened to my map? I go, oh, there it is. I go over, and now they're going to go. And you always go up to Jerusalem. Doesn't matter where you are, you go up. Okay. It has very little bearing on the actual geography. It's just you always go up. All right. See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised on the third day. Hmm. 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 I'm so tempted to stop here, but I won't. I can say it's your chance. No, no. We'll keep going. <laughs> All right. Um, Daniel, would you read for me, please? Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up to him with her sons and kneeling. Who are, who are the sons of Zebedee? Okay. Keep going. She came up to him with her sons, and kneeling before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Say that these two sons of mine are to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your kingdom. Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? They said to him, We are able. He said to them, 
You will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared for by my father. I just somehow I, I feel like Jesus suckered him in on that one. Are you can you drink with that cup? I'm gonna drink. Yes, we will. Well, in fact, you will, but I still can't let you. What? <laughs> so, how did this go over with the rest? I can't wait until the chosen handles this. But go ahead. And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. Okay, we're going to stop here. Um, important lesson. So we're at 2029, Jeff, if you will. I'm going to stop sharing now. We. Um, I'm going to stop recording too.